Today's reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 17. When you enter the land which which the Lord your God gives you, and you possess it and live in it, and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations who are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your countrymen you shall set as king over yourselves. You may not put a foreigner over yourselves who is not your countryman. Moreover, he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor shall he cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never again return that way. He shall not multiply wives for himself, or else his heart will turn away, nor shall he greatly increase silver and gold for himself. Now it shall come about when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of this law on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. It shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by careful, carefully observing all the words of this law and these statutes, that, he, that his heart may not be lifted up above his countrymen, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or the left, so that he and his sons may continue long in the kingdom in the midst of Israel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the Advent season, when uh, the church celebrates the Advent, or the coming uh, of the long-promised Messiah, most churches take this opportunity to go back into the Hebrew scriptures and to look at those uh, kind of standard prophecies uh, from Genesis all the way to Malachi concerning the birth of the Messiah. And uh, we, on the other hand, because we're a special church, we, uh, we just plow right ahead where we're going. And this year we're in the book of Deuteronomy. And we found, lo and behold, that this fourth or fifth book of the Bible, this uh, last book of the Torah, last book of Moses, uh, this book uh, does exactly what we would hope to find in an Advent series in that it points consistently to the perfect prophet, priest, and king who uh, will be fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And uh, these passages from Deuteronomy may not be the stock and standard passages that we normally look at uh, during the Advent season. Some of those uh, prophecies you know well, a child will be born to us, uh, those kind of verses. Uh, However, they are there in the book of Deuteronomy, and uh, we've been... Uh, unearthing them like uh, veins of gold in an untapped mine. Moses is now standing with the younger generation as they prepare to go into the promised land. Moses will not go with them. So there's a kind of urgency in the book. Moses is giving them what they need because he won't accompany them. And he's giving them instruction about how to live in the land and how to get settled in the land. And he knows that when that happens, that they will feel nervous. Moses won't be with them. They will feel not like a solid nation. They'll kind of compare themselves to the nations around them, and they won't feel like a big, bad national entity. And that's what they'll need to be because there's going to be battles, and to defend their borders, they'll need to be a nation. And they just feel like this loose confederation of 12 tribes. You know, we call ourselves the United States of America. They were the disunited tribes of Israel, and they were worried about that, and um, they'll need some order. And Moses is looking ahead, perhaps centuries down the road, to where they'll need organization, and they'll need direction, and they'll need some sort of centralized government for protection and for well-being. And you know that, uh, that phrase, well-being, uh, is a very important concept in the whole Hebrew scriptures. It's best summarized in a word that even if you don't know any Hebrew, you probably know this one Hebrew word, the Hebrew greeting, that is shalom. And uh, most of the time we think of it as meaning peace, like, like two people greet each other, hey man, peace, peace, shalom, shalom. But really it means much more than that in the whole theology of the Old Testament. It pictures a condition of well-being, a picture of wholeness, the way things are supposed to be. It's why the prophets would oftentimes picture this condition of shalom, where 
the prophets will repeat the refrain, the refrain, every man sat under his own vine and under his own fig tree. And it kind of pictures a scene when uh, a family on the Sabbath day would go out to enjoy the fruit of their labors. And literally, with wine in one hand and fig in the other hand, they could look out over their land and thank God for giving their land uh, a good return. And this word shalom, so important to the whole picture of the Old Testament, where God would set things right, not just peace, but a society where people are whole and where relationships flourish, where there's an absence of chaos and, and turmoil and peril, complete in the way God intended for all things to be. And while they are learning little by little to trust God to bring about this condition of shalom personally and relationally and spiritually, they have not always been willing to trust God uh, to make good on his promises. And so knowing about their weakness in this uh, trust department, God makes a third provision for them. A prophet, a priest, and if they want it, an option, a king. Today's sermon is about government. <laughs> We're all thinking a lot about government. I mean, you might be thinking, really? You want to talk about government today? Um, and you might look at the person next to you and say, you know, I was always taught in polite company, it's not right to talk about religion and politics and did we come to a church this morning where they're going to mix the two together? This is like a disaster, recipe for disaster. I just want a safe little Advent sermon. Well, no fear. I will deliver an Advent sermon today, but it won't be a safe little Advent sermon because be very afraid. If you don't know this, the Bible's main idea is a political idea. In other words... The Bible is all about a form of government, not socialism or capitalism or anarchy, but monarchy. In fact, if I had to reduce the Bible's main theme, and I'm giving this to you so you can use it at your next cocktail party. If you had to reduce the Bible's theme to one short phrase, the phrase I would use would be the kingdom of God and the promise of shalom. What's the Bible about? In one phrase, the kingdom of God and the promise of shalom. I want to look at this political idea with you today under three headings. Number one, non-shalom. Number two, sham shalom or counterfeit shalom. And number three, true shalom. Non-shalom, sham shalom, and true shalom. The people are nervous. They're looking out into the land of promise. They know that Moses will not go with them. And so he can sense their anxiety. We've seen it in our study. They're wondering if Moses won't be with us, who will speak for God? Moses has been the mediator to deliver God's words to us as a people. If Moses won't be there, who will speak for him? And God said, I will raise up from your countrymen a prophet like Moses. Then again, they felt nervous as we saw last week. What will happen when we have conflicts that we can't iron out together? What will happen when even the judges in the gates of all of our towns come to an end of themselves? What, what will there be to help us form some sort of judiciary? And God says, I will give you a supreme court. The priests will be that supreme court. And then, while they're not even feeling it yet, looking ahead to what awaits them, Moses knows and God knows. There will be nervousness in their ranks about a lack of national cohesiveness. In other words, how will they stick together when this loose confederation of tribes enters the land? And they will need to be unified because they will be fighting some big battles and be facing some big threats. And how will they be a nation when they're really not a nation? They need some sort of centralized government. How will the, the tribes hold together? And remember, they don't really have the best track record of familial solidarity. 
going all the way back to Jacob and his sons. Remember, and forgive me for the use of this word, it was really a dysfunctional family. They took one of their brothers and kidnapped him and sold him into slavery. And there's been a lot of jealousy and a lot of disharmony in that family. They don't really have the best track record. And they're going to need it. we got to stick together. United we stand. Divided we fall. If we don't get some centralized form of administration, we're going to be sitting ducks for the Canaanites. Who will make us a nation? We need a king. Now, before we go further into this, let me highlight two facts about this. Number one, well, wasn't God their king? <laughs> yes, God was their king. That's very much highlighted in the whole Hebrew Bible. And yet, God seeing the weakness in them about trusting him, God was not averse to giving them a leader they could see, a, a kind of a king. If you want a human leader, you may have a human leader. Number two, the reason they wanted a king was not simply for pragmatic reasons, not simply because they felt insecurity in the face of the Canaanites and because they were fearing the 12 tribes separating from one another and the Israelite nation falling apart. They would look at other nations with kings and they would say to themselves, gee, mom, all the other cool kids have kings. Why can't we have a king? And notice it's worded as if a single person were making the request. And you say, I will set a king over me. It's not used in the plural, but in a singular pronoun, not we, but I. As if a child is making the, the request. And here behind the request, the submerged motive of jealousy is very definitely in the background. We want to be like all the other nations. And you may know that centuries later, when this prophecy from Moses was actually fulfilled, you may know that centuries later, when the children of Israel came to the prophet Samuel with the request, we want a king. They specifically worded the request in the way Moses prophesied. Now appoint a king for us like all the nations. We want to be like everyone else. We don't want to be special. We just want to be an average nation. We want to be a common political body. And it was as if God said to them, but that's just the problem. You are not a common political body. You are a holy people. You are a unique people. And remember what we've been saying, not a very unique people. You're either unique or not. And they were a one of a kind, belonging to God, in covenant with Yahweh, single nation. And behind the request, it's not simply a political consideration like, hey, we're getting bigger. We need some structure need to be able to defend our borders. No. Behind their request was a sentiment. We are uncomfortable being a holy people. We want to be like everyone else. And that motive is not only a motive of mistrust in God's promises to give them the land. And I looked at it again this week. If you take all the different words for give, gave, giving, about a hundred times in the book of Deuteronomy, God says, I will give you the land. I promise. And this request was not only mistrusting God's promise to give them the land. It really was a repudiation of everything they were as a people and in their national mission. Again, wasn't that government was bad? People need government. God definitely had a plan for the office of the king. But... The motive from the start, and thankfully our motives don't thwart the good plans of God, but the motive from the start was wrong. We want a good thing, government, but for the wrong reasons. And this brings up our second point, sham shalom. 
counterfeit completeness. The people's refusal to trust God, to receive protection from him, to receive flourishing from him, their discomfort in believing him, their desire to be like the other nations, their pursuit of shalom, completeness without God, that was lurking in their motives and that would eventually come to the surface, looking for wholeness without God. And this brings up how we too quite often look for qualities and conditions, all kinds of things that only God can provide, and we hope to find them outside of God himself. Looking for love in all the wrong places, looking for completeness outside of God. Government is good, and government is necessary. There are some forms of government, I think we would all agree, that are better than other forms of government. In fact, in this very passage, there are some principles that were called upon by the most just governments that have ever been on planet Earth, taking some cues right out of this passage and, and others like it. But ultimately, any human government will not really be able to complete you, will not make good, will not make the wildest dreams of its citizens be able to come true. And you know, as far as I can tell, and, and, and I said last week as we talked about the judiciary in Israel, I said I'm not really qualified to talk about legal terms. I'm not an attorney, <laughs> not a legal professional. To which I'll add this week, I'm not a social scientist or a political scientist. I'm not a historian. I'm not qualified to give you a civics lesson today. However, as far as I can tell, the difference between the American Revolution and the French Revolution, 1776 and 1789, very close together in terms of world history. The difference was that our revolution saw government as a means to protect the citizens. And their revolution saw government as a means to enhance the lives of its citizens. In other words, our revolution had much more modest goals in mind for what a government could or should be. You can read about the whole thing in Closing of the American Mind by Alan Bloom. I just highly recommend that book from the 1980s, and he compares the two revolutions. Now, don't get me wrong. America has never been a Christian nation. Our revolution was not based in Christianity, but there was at least in the Continental Congress, enough of a consensus about values coming from the Judeo-Christian literature, the Bible, that we could agree on a system of government with modest expectations for what a government could or couldn't do. And the point is, in our own constitutional democracy, and you know what that means, right? Constitutional democracy. It means that ultimately it's not the will of the people that governs, and it's definitely not the will of the king that governs, it's the constitution. That idea comes right out of this passage where the king is told, it's not about your desires, it's not about your citizens' desires, it's about the constitution. Stick with the constitution. And this passage teaches that. Modest help from government. The ancient Israelites, and if they could do it, we could certainly do it. They wanted a king who could give them shalom. But no king can really give shalom. In the same way they thought the other nations got shalom. By having lofty kings who could promise the world and would, in their own deceived minds, could actually deliver on those promises. And God is saying that's not how shalom will come. Modest expectations for government. And today, as in all ages, people continue to look for transcendent qualities and conditions like inner peace, completeness, a sense of identity, a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose. Not from government only, but from all kinds of sources other than the one unique source who can provide those qualities and conditions. 
Government can do certain things. But government can't complete you. Your girlfriend can't complete you. Your job can't complete you. Your ripped body can't complete you. Your hobby, more money, more power, more sex, success, morality, none of these can make you a whole person as God intended for you to be. These are all able to provide a taste of wholeness, sometimes a kind of illusion of completeness, and personal spiritual relational flourishing, but all these are, in the end, destined to fail and produce only sham shalom. In these short paragraphs, before the king is even requested, looking ahead centuries to where the king will be requested, God puts real limits on the king as if to say, don't think the king can really complete you. Have modest expectations and know that all that glitters is not gold. And when you look at these great kingdoms in the Middle Eastern nations that surround you and these kings who act like they're gods, remember they can't make good on their promises. The nations you envy, where the grass looks greener over there, the Middle Eastern kings were very often substitutes for God. They very often represented themselves as gods. They treated their people as subjects and as servants. So when you, says God, when you set up a king, he must not multiply horses, he must not multiply wives, and he must not multiply wealth, power, sex, and money. Your kings can't do that. The Middle Eastern kings around you, they all do that. And they promise heaven, but they can't deliver. Your kings will be accountable to the Levitical priests. And that would have been totally countercultural for that time, where the priest was accountable to anyone. But your king, said the Lord, will be accountable to the priests, and your king will be accountable to the law. A balance of powers, as we might say. His first task, very first thing he does after he is anointed and declared as king, a kind of inauguration might take place, and then the very next thing he does, the first royal task he has, is to take his own hand, pick up a quill, dip it in the ink pot, and write for himself a copy of the law with a Levitical priest watching him. He has to touch the parchment. He has to form the letters with his own hands. He has to have the law engraved on his thinking to be intimately acquaint, acquainted with my instruction, says the Lord. And then the king has to keep it with him wherever he goes, and he has to read it every day. Wherever there's a decision, the decision to be made, he has to consult the law. He has to look into the instructions of God and make his decisions, not based on the will of the people, certainly not based on his own desires, but based on the Constitution. The Torah. Why? Because it's not in God's nation, rex lex. The king is the law. In God's nation, it's lex rex. The law is king. And the king has to submit himself to the law. Same thing in our, the formation of our own government. In the Puritan Revolution in England, it was always assumed among all the European nations, rex lex, the king is the law, the divine right of kings. You remember this from your, your high school studies, the divine right of kings. They were put in power and then they were like the spokesman for God. And God is saying from the beginning, no, in my nation, it will be lex rex. The law is king and the king must submit himself to that. He is an earthly ruler who himself has a ruler. He submitted to me, says the Lord, and he must face that, carrying the law around with him every day. And once again, you know, as modern readers to the ancient text, just like we did last week, you might be wondering, well, TJ, that's amazing. 
They had such an advanced form of checks and balances and the balances of power in that ancient, ancient nation. Were Israel's kings, just like you're saying, were they tangibly, were they demonstrably different from the kings of the Gentile nations? TJ, I'm a little rusty on my uh, biblical history and the way it unfolded. So could you, could you just remind me, how did that go? Did the kings of Israel, did they reject that God complex into which all the ancient Middle Eastern kings fell? And did the Israelite kings, just remind me about this, TJ, I can't remember. Did the Israelite kings amass horses, wives, gold, horses to look powerful, wives to look virile and sexy, gold to look rich? How did that go? Well, I'm glad you asked. It didn't go very well. First king they inaugurated was a big guy like Gaston from Beauty and the Beast. And he was head and shoulders above the crowd. Handsome guy named Saul. And his administration almost immediately imploded and he forgot who he was. The prophet Samuel warned them, but they went ahead with it. After Saul self-destructed, God chose a kid, David. He was like lowest on the totem pole among all of his siblings. They gave him the worst task in the whole family, like a street sweeper. He was a shepherd and the youngest of his brothers. Wouldn't have been the people's choice, but it was God's. And it turns out he was a good king. And all their history the Israelites would look back to him. To this very day, Israel uses the Star of David as their symbol. He had some failings, some pretty big ones. He forgot who he was, and his heart was lifted up. He forgot that really he was a nobody. He was a street sweeper. He was a shepherd. And he got all confident, like you two sing, some people got way too much confidence, baby. And David got too used to smiling for the camera. But he did repent. And as such, he was a model to the nation. Some of the other kings were so good that they never really had to repent. But David repented, and God supremely values that. And he modeled that to the nation. And in that way, he was a great example. After David, you remember Solomon? Solomon was right on track, did exactly what Moses said not to do. He multiplied horses, wives, and money, made a big mess. And then his sons came along, they made an even bigger mess, divided the nation in a civil war. And you know the phrase, power corrupts. Ultimate power corrupts ultimately. It's like when we get too much power, we just can't handle it. None of us. It's like Tolkien's ring of power, where once you put it on, you begin to get warped by it. Just like we've been seeing in the, in the current spate of sex scandals in our nation. Powerful men getting so powerful that the power goes to their head and they forget who they are. And they think they can use people like objects. They get warped. Some of the kings in David's line, kings of the tribe of Judah. Remember, Judah was to be the royal tribe. Genesis 49, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Some of the kings in the line of Judah, like Hezekiah and Josiah. Remember Josiah? said, how can I govern if I don't have the law? And they found the law in the temple. First time that a king really tried to submit himself to the law. Some did roughly abide by the Torah. But mostly, they failed miserably, not only to promote the shalom of the people, but even to guard the shalom of the people. Until one king... You might never have heard of his name before. 
he was called Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. He was born in a beautiful sprawling palace. No, he was born in a carport that was attached to a little tiny bed and breakfast in a town named after a bakery. He was born in a barn. He wasn't much for money or horses. There is a record of him riding on a horse one time. In fact, he rode into Jerusalem to his own inauguration, riding a horse. But he didn't opt for a horse, much to the chagrin of his closest followers. He instead opted for a donkey. And I'm sure they, his disciples, were just embarrassed in the moment and said, Lord, you're going to an inauguration in an old jalopy? You're supposed to go in a motorcade. This is so unpresidential. Frankly, we're a little embarrassed. He did get some gold once and frankincense and myrrh as an infant. But as he got older, he had no place to lay his head. And he died penniless, didn't even own the clothing on his own back. He didn't multiply wives. In fact, he stayed faithful to the one bride his father chose for him. And this Prince of Peace, the Sar Shalom, he was so above her in status and in appearance and in character and in every way. He was radiant and he was royal and faithful and educated beyond anyone had all the knowledge and good, and she, on the other hand, was a prostitute, a woman of ill repute. She was below him in every way, but he loved her. And his heart was not lifted up and arrogant. And so in order to win her affection, he had to come in a way so that she would not be intimidated by his greatness and just simply cringe and die of shame in his presence. And if he came with all his royal robes, you know about his robes? It said the train of his robe filled the temple. And so he couldn't wear the robes in front of her. And if he came with all of his armies, she would have been so intimidated, she just would have run and hid. So he arrived, this Prince of Shalom, showing his true nature. He arrived humble and lowly as a servant. His heart was not lifted up. And his one love, this beloved, unfaithful woman, she still didn't get it. She didn't know the things that make for shalom. But still, he kept the Torah for her. He obeyed in her place. He was the king who meditated on God's law day and night and never turned to the left or to the right. He obeyed in her place. He obeyed in my place. And then this king, whose face was radiant and blinding like the sun, he gave himself to die for her crimes, for her unfaithfulness, for all of her unkept promises. And he even wore a crown for her, a crown of pain, a crown of thorns. And when he had showed her his true nature, when God incarnate in Jesus Christ showed her his true nature, his real character, that God himself loves to serve and that the king of kings is actually humble and when he had paid the price that justice demand, and when he had gone as low as he could to meet her, he went so low, he didn't even stand on the earth, he went under the earth. He was buried in a tomb under the weight of her punishment. And three days later, when he rose from the dead, he came to her and he said, Arise, my darling my beautiful one, and come along. For behold, the winter is past. 
The rain is over and gone. The flowers have already appeared in the land. The time has arrived for pruning the vines. And the voice of the turtle dove has been heard in our land. The fig tree has ripened its figs, and the vines in blossom have given forth their fragrance. Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come along. See, it's a picture of shalom, true shalom, that only the sar shalom could provide. Nothing else in your life can make you whole but this king. It's a picture of the peace and the flourishing that we all want. It's the Prince of Peace who died for the sins of his unfaithful bride. The government is on his shoulders. Look, listen to him today. Receive his words today. Receive him today. If you're already a Christian, receive him again, maybe for the 10,000th time. If you're not a Christian, what are you waiting for? Receive him and the forgiveness and the new life that he holds on his shoulders. Go to him now. Believe in him and become complete. Let's pray together.